thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come into church, Lord, and support the church and give to the church as the church continues the mission of Christ in the world in which we live. We thank you and praise you for those people that are here today, those that give, Lord. Let them be blessed uh, abundantly in many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so I am, uh, I'm doing this, this, these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And what I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to uh, go through the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and, and see what it means for us today. So uh, uh, on the back of your bulletin, you'll see uh, it says after Easter, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And this particularly is Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John. So those are the, those are the instances that we'll be talking about today. Hopefully we'll be able to get through some of it. Uh, I'll read the scripture a after the partial, uh, uh, the introduction. But the night was gone. Uh, the night of the death of Jesus Christ uh, had passed. Uh, what a tumultuous day. And what a, a tremendously difficult day, not only, of course, for Jesus Christ, but also for his followers that put all their hope uh, in him. Uh, the bright dawn of Easter morning had burst, and Jesus had risen from the dead. What a glorious thing. What a glorious statement. Jesus has risen from the dead, right? We say that uh, so, uh, so easily now, but yet, what did it take for Jesus to rise from the dead? It took his life. It took his death for him to rise from the dead for us. And for our salvation, right? That's what we say. We say for us and our salvation. With a different physical body that Joseph of Arimathea had placed in the tomb, uh, Jesus' body rose from the dead, bearing the wounds from what he had previously went through, the thorns, the scars from the thorns, the beating, the whipping, the nails, and then the spear in the side. And Jesus, uh, will Jesus appear to his uh, followers, his disciples? And that's a question that they were asking themselves. And many were asking, you know, what will happen next? Uh, unbelief found its climax in Good Friday, I suggest to you. Uh, unbelief of the disciples, unbelief of many people. Well, he said he was the Christ. He said he was God, and yet this is happening to him. And many questions uh, that Jesus' followers had were this. Maybe questions that you would have if you were living in the day of Jesus, living in Jerusalem at the time, or even maybe being a follower of Jesus at the time. Would you ask these questions? Why did he die? Why did he have to die? Didn't he say it was God? Uh, it's repugnant to our understanding. Why did Jesus have to die? And, and why did he allow this uh, to happen to himself if he is God? And then we become we start looking at things introspectively. Uh, what do we do now? Where are we? What do we do now? Was this all done in vain? Was all of his ministries, all of his teachings, was it all done in vain? Now we have no leader. We have no direction. Uh, what are we to do? And then ultimately, what happens next? So these are the questions that the disciples had uh, after the uh, death of Jesus. But let us reflect for a moment upon his, uh, his, his death uh, and then, of course, his resurrection. Uh, the death, of course, was recorded by the gospel writers. And there's five uh, important elements of the death of Christ, which ultimately relate to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first is this that I wrote, that his death implies a voluntary act of freedom, a voluntary act of love for all, the death. The most important aspect of his death was that it implies a voluntary act of love and freedom on, the, on behalf of Jesus. The second aspect of his death, looking back at things now, is that no one could take his life away from him without him allowing it. Do you understand that? This was a free act by Christ. He could have stopped it at any time in his humanity, or his divinity for that matter. But he chose to give his life willingly. The third element is this, that he had completed the work that the Father had directed him to do, uh, which, uh, thank God for that, that the world would be saved, that we would have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus. And then the fourth thing that Jesus did was this, he dismissed his spirit. He dismissed, he dismissed his spirit, he gave up his spirit, and he gave up his spirit willingly and voluntarily. And then the final thing that he uttered was this, immediately before his death, he attested and said these words, it is finished. It is finished. And that signifies a divine consciousness that his earthly mission was completed and he had followed the will of God the Father in his life. And that completed 
the person and work of Jesus Christ on that Good Friday day. And so now we look forward to <coughs> the resurrection. And now the resurrection uh, is the climax of faith. The climax of faith and the climax of belief. And as we look through these things, as we look through the appearances, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, why don't we focus on the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus very often? Because they're a little bit complicated, and you have to dig very deep to uh, understand uh, its implicit meaning as to look at every time Jesus appeared to somebody was for a reason and was for a purpose. And we have to kind of unearth those things, and the casual reader uh, will not be able to unearth those things. And there's nuances with these particular appearances, but I think that they're beneficial for us to at least dialogue about that and talk about that. I, I can't give a, uh, an in-detail lecture on each appearance. That would take me probably several years to do that, uh, to unpack all the information. But we can do something generally that would be profitable for a Sunday morning service. But we'll look at some aspects of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and we'll do that over the next few weeks. The nature of the evidence and the resurrection proofs we'll look at. We'll, we'll look at the context of the different faiths that we see in these resurrection appearances. And what do I mean by that? But everybody's faith was at a different level. Just like me and you, our faiths are at different levels. Some of us are uh, on one level, some of us are on another. Not that one is bad and one is good, but just that we all progress in God's timeline for our lives, right? And we're all different. We all have faith. We believe that Christ has risen from the dead and we have salvation because we've received Christ and we have eternal life, right? But, but our faiths are at different stages. And sometimes even in my life, faith is at different stages in my life. Sometimes it's really high, I like to say, and then sometimes I struggle uh, in unbelief in things, right, like we all do. Those are natural things that we go. Not that I would ever uh, not believe that Jesus Christ had died and was resurrected from the dead and that I have eternal hope and salvation only in him and the forgiveness of sins. But sometimes when we go through life circumstances, Circumstances, it kind of it shakes us a little bit and we have to be honest about those things but we'll look at the appearances of Jesus and its significance and the application of Jesus appearances to our life and then maybe the most important question of all the practical application of what do these appearances of Jesus mean for the church and mean for us today so we're looking back 2,000 years ago about those post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and trying to uh, integrate those uh, into the church in our life today. So with that being said, let me read this beautiful dissertation found in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, uh, of course, it's my dissertation subject matter, and I love John's Gospel. Uh, I love Matthew, Mark, Luke, too. Uh, but, uh, but John's really just, to me, stands out. And maybe I can give you some justification for why I love John's Gospel so much, because, as we say, uh, his high Christology soars high above as an eagle. And we have John chapter 20. I'm going to read this long portion for you. And really, it's divided into two parts. Uh, it's divided first into Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John. And then Mary is isolated by herself. So I'll go through these. And what we'll do is hopefully, I don't have a lot of time today. I have about uh, 15 minutes. And maybe I can get through some of this. And then I'll finish it up next week because I won't be able to get done with all my notes that I have on this particular subject matter. I've learned long ago uh, that I have yet to finish a sermon uh, in one setting. I have one, two, I probably have 20 pages of notes here. So I probably have three or four sermons in here, so I don't want to bore you with that. But we'll, we'll talk about the most important subjects matters. I guess the professor's laughing because she, she knows that when she prepares a class that the notes outweigh the time that she has. Yep. And she doesn't want to put the students all to sleep, neither do I want to put you to sleep on a Sunday morning. So anyway, uh, John chapter 20, if you look at your bulletins, let's read this. I'll read this to you. Early on the first day of the week... While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen, strips of linen, lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the first tomb first, went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over, looked into the tomb, and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. So this is a beautiful, these are beautiful post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, the first thing, I'm going to probably start with the first thing, the last thing first, because you're probably all wondering, well, why did Jesus... Uh, tell uh, Mary uh, not to, uh, do not hold me. But Mary saw Jesus and didn't realize it was Jesus at first. Isn't that amazing? I mean, she was there at the tomb, and she's crying, and she's upset that her Lord had been crucified, that he was killed, and now they went back to the tomb on Easter morning, and, it, and he wasn't there, and she wasn't thinking that he had resurrected. She thought that somebody took the body. And then she saw this man standing over there, the gardener, and she thought that he took the body and moved it somewhere. And she mis mistaken the gardener for Jesus. And I wonder, how could somebody so close to Jesus mistaken him for the gardener? I don't know. But it's very interesting that we find later on, about a few weeks later, when Jesus interacts with Thomas, and he says, Thomas, take your finger and put it in where the nail was and put your hand in the side. So in that instance, Jesus allows... Thomas to touch his body, right? But here, he didn't want Mary to touch his body. Well, what could be the difference? Well, I think the difference is a very simple explanation, and you may not know the answer to this, and we may not know the answer to this, but I can surmise that Mary clung on to him and grabbed hold of him and would not want to let him go. And he had work to do, and he had not yet ascended into heaven. And he was telling her, first of all, I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven, and you have to let go of me. You can't cling to me because you have to go do things too. You have to go tell the disciples where I'm going to go. But it was really Jesus telling her in a way that I'm not going to be here very long. And yet when he interacts with Thomas, he interacts with Thomas because Thomas didn't believe. And Thomas even said, I'm not going to believe that he rose from the dead unless I can take my finger and put it in his hand and put my hand in the side. So one was done because there, she was overcome with love and exuberance, and the other was done in a way of doubt. So I think that there's a distinction there that we can, we can look at. But when we talk about these particular appearances that Jesus gave, it's interesting that you know Christ had risen, and there's this appearance and it's taken two different ways, and I'm going to try to get into that because I, I'll suggest to you that there's two types of faith that are working its way out here. The first section is where John believes. It appears that looking at Scripture, that John may in fact be the first disciple and maybe the first person to believe that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Because when he went to the tomb, remember, Peter and John, Mary was at the tomb first, and she said to them, the tomb is empty, right? So she runs back. She gets Peter and John. Peter and John run out to the tomb. This is early Easter morning. And then John gets there first because John had his Wheaties in the morning. <laughs> I'm just testing you to make sure you're awake and up to, you know. Yeah, everyone up? Okay, good. It's a nice sunny day, and a lot of people play hooky on nice sunny days. But you're here, so let's be awake. We've got to get through this. We've got a few more minutes. Hold on. So Peter and John run out. John gets there first. Why? He had his Wheaties. And Peter's, you know, carrying a little extra weight there. Peter gets there second. But John is afraid to go in, or he looks in. He sees what's going on. He sees the linen. But Peter runs in, and, of course, they see the linen lying there uh, in two formats, the burial cloth for the head and the burial cloth for the body. At that point in time, 
John believes. You may say, well, Pastor, how do you know that John believes and Peter didn't believe? Because John wrote it down. And he wrote down this. He saw and believed. And then he wrote, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. So John is akin that when he got to the tomb and he saw the linen wrapped for the head and the linen wrapped for the body and no body was there, Jesus' body wasn't there, that everything came flooding back to John all at once, that he had resurrected from the dead. He had resurrected from the dead. This was so important. And that's why John's Christology maybe soars high above everybody else. He had tremendous insight. He was the disciple what? He was the disciple that Jesus loved. So, you know, maybe Jesus didn't give him that name tag or that title for anything, but he gave it to him for a reason because he understood some of these beautiful concepts. And he was the first disciple to believe that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And even Mary. This is one time the disciples kind of outdo the women, I guess, right? Mary thought that they stole the body. But later on she realizes that he had risen from the dead. So John's faith is beautiful in the sense, and I call it faith by believing but not seeing. John didn't see Jesus at that point. right? He saw an empty tomb. And yet he believed. And I began to think to myself, well, that's kind of how we believe, right? We see an empty tomb. We don't see a body. We see an empty tomb, and yet we believe. Yet we believe that Christ is alive today as much today as he was 2,000 years ago. We've made him our Lord and Savior of our life. We've, we've dedicated our life to him. We, we found forgiveness of sin in him, right? We found eternal life through him. He is the only way to find eternal life. No other way but through Jesus Christ. So we found the faith in a way, I think, like John and I like that, because I think that's a beautiful faith. It's faith without seeing, right? Believing without seeing. I think that's the real nature and definition of faith. I won't talk about Peter now, because it doesn't seem like Peter understood and believed that Jesus had risen from the dead, fulfilling all the prophecies and fulfilling all that he had taught about, that he would be stricken, and on the third day he would rise from the dead. See, our, our faith and our hope and all that we believe hinges on the resurrection. See, if Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, then he just becomes a, a, a man, a moral teacher, with good insight and good morals. But the moment he was resurrected, it confirmed to the world that he was son of the living God. That's why the resurrection is so important and critical to our Christian faith. And that's why these resurrection appearances are so critical to confirm and authenticate that he had indeed risen from the dead. And so John has this beautiful faith that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And then we see Mary. She's so upset about Jesus and she's concerned about his body. And she sees these, this man standing there, and she thought it was the gardener, and she accuses the gardener of taking the body, stealing the body. And then he said to her, Mary. All he did was call her name. And she heard his voice. Does that sound familiar to you? He, she heard his voice, and she knew immediately that this was the Lord. And she believed. But she believed after she had an interaction with the resurrected Christ. She didn't believe like John believed when she saw the empty tomb. She didn't immediately believe that he had been resurrected. It wasn't until Jesus had an interaction with her and that she was talking to the gardener. Can you imagine the surprise that Mary had? She's talking to the gardener, and there's a lot of reasons why maybe she didn't recognize him because he was in resurrected form. He was in a bodily appearance, but it was different than what it was before. But it was not so different because she thought he was a gardener. So he still had that appearance as a man, right? He still had the appearance as a man. And so Mary has this beautiful interaction with Jesus. And then once he discloses, uncloaks, that it's me, it's Jesus, she says, teacher. And she's so excited. And then she grabs hold of Jesus. And Jesus said, do not, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father in heaven. And so uh, we have this beautiful exchange here. But there's different scenes. And I said to you this morning, there's different scenes of faith here. We have demonstrated the faith of John. John's faith was different than Peter's. And Peter's faith was different than Mary's. And Mary's faith was different than John. So we have all different types of faiths going on here. But it's a beautiful scene nevertheless. Here's the three elements that I want to kind of share with you 
as it relates to this particular portion or this post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. It's this. That we do have those two different faiths. We have the faith which says to God, I believe you because you've said in Scripture the things that you said. And I believe that, and I believe this by faith. But then there's also a faith that maybe you'll have to go through some circumstances of life. Maybe you'll, you'll challenge God somehow, and, and that God will come through in that challenge for you, although he doesn't have to. And then you say, oh, because God did this, I believe now. I mean, as long as you believe, it'd be better to believe just because you believe that Jesus is who he said he was. But however you have to come to faith in Christ, whether it's the way that John came to faith in Christ, or whether it's the way Peter came to faith in Christ, or whether it's the way Thomas came to faith in Christ, at least you've come to Christ, and you've come to faith. But what we can learn from Mary's post-resurrection interaction with Jesus is this. The first thing is this. He calls his own by name. All he said to her, Mary's looking for the gardener, and he turns to Mary and says, Mary, that's all he said. And she recognized that that was the great shepherd, mm -hmm. like a sheep recognizes. When I call my ducks, or at least when I used to call my ducks, my ducks could be literally a half a mile away. And I'll say to my ducks, go home, go home. And if they're a half a mile away, or as loud as my voice can carry, you'll hear the ducks quack back, and they'll hear my voice, and they'll all come home. And it's like the sheep. When the sheep hear the shepherd's voice, they come home. When you hear the shepherd's voice, you come home. So the first element that we have to look at in this post-resurrection account of Jesus with, as it relates to Mary, because John didn't see Jesus yet, right? But Mary did. He calls his own by name. He's called each and every one of you by name. And it's amazing to think that there's so many people in the world, but he's called you individually, Mark and John and Mary, and all of you he calls by name. The second thing is this. Mary knew his voice. She may not have recognized him or could distill who it was, but she recognized his voice. And you too could recognize the voice of God in your life. You know when God is speaking with you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know when you're telling yourself something, right? We can discern the, the difference. God is always going to tell us to do the right thing, to do the, the godly thing, to follow his commands, and to always be pushing us forward in the relationship with God. And everything else is noise. So the second thing is this, that we know his voice. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And then the third thing is this. They respond and accept his call. They respond and accept. They hear his voice. He calls them by name. And you receive the call of Christ in your life. And so this is how faith works. And this is how faith is operational uh, in the post-resurrection accounts of Jesus Christ. And they're very important. And they have practical import for us in our lives today. And as we think about these things, we'll look at these different scenes of what the empty tomb really signifies and how the disciples all kind of react differently in a way to these appearances that Jesus gave. But ultimately is this. Jesus will be on earth for the next 40 days after his resurrection, before he ascends to God the Father in heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father until he comes again. And he makes intercession for you. He makes intercession for all of us and for you individually each and every day of your life before the throne of God. So these are all the beautiful things. When you acknowledge the empty tomb, the empty tomb is empty because the gardener took the body away. The tomb is empty because he's overcome sin and death. Amen. And he's resurrected. And that's the great hope we have as Christians, that we have eternity. Whether we're here today or gone tomorrow, look, at I don't know how long I'll be here. I don't know how long you'll be here. Only God knows. But make every day count for Jesus. Live your life for Christ. And know that when you transition from this life to the next, you're in eternity. And how do I know that? I know that because Christ is resurrected from the dead. And his promises are true. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that these post-resurrection accounts of Jesus build our faith and encourage us in the way of God each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.